thank you so much everyone for joining us uh, today. My name is S.Y. Lim and I'm the Director of Programming at Manic Contemporary Chicago. Uh, today uh, we have um, our first iteration of the Community Talk um, and this program was also supported by Monera Foundation. Um, if you guys have any questions during the talk, uh, please let us know. Um, this talk will be around 35 to 45-ish minutes. Um, and I was gonna read the bio, but what do you feel like? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just gonna pass the mic. Uh, everyone, please welcome Janine. Thanks, that's why, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I think some of you know the Arts Club. This is meant as a general introduction, but maybe you'll learn some things that you don't know. So um, I'm uh, Janine, and I've been at the Arts Club um, for just a little over a decade, actually, which went very quickly. Um, I came from um, Swarthmore College, which is a liberal arts college outside of Philadelphia, where I was a a professor for a decade there. So I don't have a lot of jobs. I just do a job for a decade, <laughs> another job. So those are my two jobs. Um, but at Swarthmore, um, I was a scholar of Dada and Surrealism, the interwar avant-garde. So that's my um, area of research and my specialty. Um, and I came to the Arts Club just prior to the 100th anniversary of the institution. So I don't know if it was fate for them or for me, but um, the Arts Club's history sort of intersected with my own expertise. Uh, famously, Marcel Duchamp was one of the people who came to the Arts Club in the early um, decades and organized a few important exhibitions that really changed the history, the subsequent history of the Arts Club. My own particular research had to do with object art and it had to do with um, tactility. So basically the kind of embodied experience of work that is conceptual and the problem of that intersection of work that is kind of maybe designed from the point of view of trying to be indifferent or intellectual and at the same time is fully corporeal um, in different ways. So hence the image of a breast on the <laughs> cover of my book. Um, and uh, so, in anticipation of the 100th anniversary, I had to sort of figure out, you know, how do we, how do we honor that? How do we celebrate it? What does it mean? Um, and then what is the institution that I'm taking over and how to, how to guide it to turn it into, you know, to, to kind of honor that history, but also make it relevant and current in the, in the present day. So I'll talk a little bit about my own, uh, practice my own thinking about things and then also to introduce you to what, what we do. So that's just a picture of the banners that we got put up for our 100th anniversary and the cover of the book that we wrote. So we ended up um, writing a book, you know, at first I was like, do we need another book? But then I really realized that we did. First of all, it, um, it um, includes like entries on the acquisitions of the institution. So that's a really good resource for people trying to know more about us. And then an incredible chronology written by um, one of our staff member Yachin Zhao, who uh, really dug in and kind of found out things that we weren't didn't know ourselves and some of the things, some of the highlights and sort of just put it in there. And then the book is, is um, divided by the different arts. So the Arts Club is mostly, I think, celebrated for its visual art program, but actually there's a strong dance history, architecture history, music history, um, and so there's different scholars contributed a little bit about that. Um, so I came, I had that incredible experience in the first five years of being at the Arts Club sort of to learn about the history, to take the time to do the scholarship. Within the like two weeks of being there, I had gone to the Newberry Library, which is where our archives are kept, and the librarians were like, who is this director? <laughs> but like, the, no one ever comes to see these archives, you know, who works there. But like scholars come all the time, but I was like, that was like one of my first things to do. But I knew we were kind of needing to, to examine ourselves. So I'll give you a little bit of that history just so you, uh, just because it's fun. Um, we were founded in the Fine Arts Building, which is across the street, remains across the street from the Art Institute. If you've never been there, it's a very interesting, wacky building that continues to have some artist studios. Um, 
a violin maker, performance space, I think a lot of therapists, all kinds of things. But at the time it was galleries mostly. Um, we were on the top floor. Um, there's some uh, records of Frank Lloyd Wright giving one of our first lectures about um, Japanese prints from his own collection. Um, so when we had the centennial event, we reenacted that in the fine arts building in the violin shop. So that was pretty fun. Um, and at the time we were, in the very first years, we were a, a co-organization with the, um, the Artists Guild of Chicago. And that was more of a kind of arts and crafts makers institution. So it, we were founded as a kind of, of um, meeting of makers and um, consumers of art what they called um, art lovers and art workers at the time. Um, and so we were always founded to be a, an institution, a, a kind of community of both the makers and the appreciators of art. Eventually we split off from the Artists Guild. It wasn't a good marriage um, in some ways, but that kind of um, impulse to be a community of both kinds of, of people has maintained itself. So we moved gradually up Michigan Avenue North and if you can sort of chart the locations of the arts club, you can also chart the locations of the art world in Chicago. Um, so we were in the Wrigley Building for a long time and then ultimately moved on to Ontario Street, um, where we are today. Um, well, Ontario and Rush first, which is a little bit west of where we are today, and then to 201 East Ontario, um, where we are now. And I'll just say, so in the Wrigley building, we were very fancy. You can see the staircase. Where there were two different locations. It was rather grand. And this was all leading up to World War II, so from the early, um, the early century into World War II. Um, in, in the 20s, for about five years, we had a room at the Art Institute. Um, and that was a moment when the Art Institute did not show 20th century art. Um, and they didn't really want to show 20th century art. There were a few people who um, who were trustees who did, and they kind of worked out a deal where the Arts Club could do things that were more adventuresome, let's say, than the Art Institute wanted to. And so we had um, the first Picasso exhibition, actually 100 years ago this week. Um, it was on March 21st, I think it opened, or March 20th, um, you know, 1923. So that's incredible, we just, had, um, we just realized that. We are like, wow, that was this week. Um, and that was in the little room that we had at the Art Institute. And that petered away after five years because of tensions, I guess. I read all the letters about it, and it never really set, you know, in the archive. Um, and it was just sort of, you know, the Arts Club's sort of formal um, statement was that it was, you know, taking new directions and wanted control over But there was definitely some tension about how daring the art should be. Which is funny because in 1923, Picasso wasn't really so <laughs> scary, you know, like actually Cubism had come and gone <laughs> and he was already making kind of classicizing work um, and, you know, he's sort of drawing like anger at the moment. So it, it's funny to think that it was you know, too, too daring for the Art, Art Institute. But, you know, the Arts Club was founded in response to the Armory Show. Um, in which students of, from SAIC had, you know, protested against Matisse and burned an effigy of him. So that whole history that I think you probably all know, we were a kind of response to that. So there, it was the first institution in the United States to show the art of its time as a, as a goal. But actually it was quite an eclectic, um, if you look back at the records of the different early exhibitions, there were crazy things exhibited. It wasn't just, you know, the most avant-garde art there was textiles and silver and things from people's personal collections and then local artists and different organizations. So it was fairly eclectic, actually, in the beginning. Um, when uh, the Wrigley Building got a little more expensive, actually, for us, and then World War II came, and this connection that we had, that was a transatlantic connection between Paris and Chicago, and if you think about it, you know, in the early 20th century, Chicago was the, if you had to go west, if you wanted to go anywhere, you had to come through Chicago from the East Coast. So anybody sort of traveling anywhere stopped in Chicago. And so it was this incredible hub, um, and it, 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 you had to be there. Um, and then the war came, and a lot of those connections shut down, and the sort of direct connection that the Arts Club had with these kind of tastemakers like, um, 
uh, Rue Carpenter, who was one of our founders, who's best friend with um, Ger Gerald Murphy and his wife, Sarah Murphy. I don't know if you've heard of them, but Gerald Murphy's an American Cubist, and Gerald and Sarah Murphy was the couple that F. Scott Fitzgerald based the novel Tender is the Night Upon. They were the people who kind of founded the Riviera, the French Riviera in the summertime, because the French thought it was too warm. So the Mer in the summertime, and they never went there, and it was the Americans who came and kind of turned it into like the sophisticated party spot. And those were like the best friends of the founders of the Arts Club. And so that's how we got that Picasso show. <laughs> those were those kind of um, very upscale connections. Um, and then the war came and that kind of, you know, inter interaction was difficult and the Arts Club definitely went through a struggle um, and temporarily put its collections on hold um, in storage. And it was a moment when the institution could have ended, but instead another director, uh, not a director actually, a, a president. So I'm, my title is executive director, um, but uh, until the, my, my predecessor and a couple of other people temporarily, the Arts Club was run by its members. And so the, it didn't have a professional sort of curatorial staff until the 1990s. So the president was like, the, these, the kind of volunteer members were the people who really ran it. So this woman named Rue Shaw took over in the, um, during the um, 40s. And she moved us into um, the, uh, this new space on Ontario and Rush, and she hired Miss Mamoreau to design it. Um, and the, one of the first people she invited to come give a um, performance was John Cage. And so this was like kind of the rebirth of the Arts Club. Instead of it sort of petering out in mid-century, it ended up kind of being reborn. Um, and so this is the interior of the Mies space in a building that is now um, like Lux Bar, what's that called? <laughs> or, I forget, it, on the second floor, kind of above TJ Maxx. Um, on Ontario and Rush, so not a very glamorous building at this time. And in fact, when we were there, it was still a commercial building. Um, when it was going to be torn down for development, the Arts Club and its allies tried to get it historic preservation status and failed. And so instead, we bought a piece of land on Ontario um, and St. Clair and held a competition. And the winning architect was a student of Mies, um, and he proposed to rescue this staircase that you see there. Um, and he basically redesigned, that's John Vinci, who's still around. Um, he redesigned the space very much with the same decor um, and aesthetic of the mid-century. When that came out in the 90s, it was kind of critically um, uh, attacked because if you think about architecture in the 1990s, it was the real rise of postmodernism. And so the modernist aesthetic of our interior and this very unassuming exterior was criticized as not being bold enough, not taking a chance, not marking the most modern aesthetic. Um, and uh, Blair came and wrote a pretty nasty review of it. But it turns out we're thrilled. <laughs> we were, did not get a postmodern building that's sort of like falling apart and looking really dated in 2023. Um, but instead, it's like this classic, um, you know, the, the outside is pretty unassuming. And it's kind of a beige brick building. And, you know, there are times as the director where I'm like, ah, I just wish we had a little bit more like curb appeal so that people knew we were there. Because I'm sure, how many of you have been to the Arts Club? Okay, that's good, more than I thought. Yay, <laughs> that's great. Um, so the exhibitions draw people, um, and I'm hoping my talk today will draw you to it, come regularly, but um, we did add a signage on the street corner, which was one of my big accomplishments. So there is a sign now um, with changing posters for the exhibitions. And this is the interior, so just a little tease if you haven't been there. The Calder, we... Um, commissioned directly from Alexander Calder during the war. There's great letters in the archives where he calls it his beastie um, and shows little drawings of how he thinks it's gonna look and where it's gonna go, um, not in this space, but in a prior space. But the exhibit, I wanna stress, the exhibition space is open to the public, free of charge. Anytime there's an exhibition, you're welcome to come. Um, and then there, we are actually a membership organization still, as we were founded to be. Um, and that's why I'm not, I wasn't going to like pitch, but I will, because that's why asked me to mention membership. So I will tell you how that works um, in case you're interested. 
Uh, we do have some members here if you want to ask them about it, Bobby's a member. But um, to be a member of the Arts Club, you, you need a letter from a current member and two additional signatures from current members. Um, if you're in MANA, then you know current members. And we can help you figure out who they are. Um, if you don't know current members and you just moved to Chicago, let's say we do make introductions um, so that people who are not you know, inside the community can be introduced. If you're a visual artist member, you do have to submit an exhibition history and any critical reception that you have. So visual, we, um, there's a kind of higher bar to get in if you want to be a visual artist member because we want to make sure that the people who are part of our member show are you know, working artists with a, a commitment to being artists and not you know, somebody who makes art on the side of something else. And actually that's okay too, as long as you have a critical reception. <laughs> um, so the bar is kind of like uh, recognition by your peers, critical reception, an exhibition history in selective institutions and not just sort of um, self-exhibiting or self-published. And we, that goes for uh, visual artists, but also musicians and writers and whatever. So we make it harder because we do have a sliding scale of dues. So if you're applying to be a visual artist member, you pay less than half of what a patron member pays. And there's also a mid-category mid for applied artists, or commercial artists, and architects, and people who are administrators in the arts. So we really do try to like, emphasize that making the dues structure support this fact that we do want to have working artists as part of the community. Um, and it's also deeply discounted if you're under 40 years old. So, Unfortunately, then on the flip side, when you hit 40, it jumps up a quite a bit, but it's like 25% of the full cost if you're under 40. So that's the pitch. If you're interested, you can get an application and let me know. And I wouldn't have done it, but of course, we want all of you to jump. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the kind of a few highlight exhibitions for me. Um, and just to say a little bit about my practice as a curator, I know people are always like, you know, what do you do there and why and what do you, how do you choose things and what is your, what's your approach to what you do? And I started with the, telling you a little bit about the history of the club to tell you a little bit about you know, my thinking about the institution and the way I curate there. Um, because of the really incredible history of the arts club and its ties to people like Marcel Duchamp or um, Brancusi or Mies van Rowe um, and my training as an art historian, um, I tend to be moved by artists who are somehow going to engage that history. And that comes in different formats. Um, and it's not proscriptive. I mean, I can't say that every single show I've ever done works in that way. And I will say that um, sometimes I've been surprised at the way it has. Because when you make an introduction to a new artist and they either know the Arts Club or learn about the Arts Club, every single one of them that I've met have been moved by that history and want to engage with it in a particular way. One of the most deeply um, like <laughs> responsive artists to that history was one of my early um, invitations to Josiah McElhenney. Um, and he shows at Corbett versus Dempsey in town, but also, um, you know, that's just one of his galleries. And he was known many, for many years as a glass artist, actually, but he's a very conceptual practice and a research-based practice. And I'm thinking about that now, a decade into being at the Arts Club. I think you guys can tell me, I mean, there, there's such a strong um, strain of art about a decade ago, kind of, that was deeply research-based. And I think it still is, you know, being practiced, but I feel like it's less prevalent now than it was then. So it hit very well timing-wise for me and for this sort of rethinking about what the Arts Club was gonna be. So anyway, Josiah made this incredible um, glass room inside of the Arts Club speaking to its history. I mean, he kind of like fully engaged with what the Arts Club meant. And he uh, departed from a quote from Adolf Loos, who was an architect, a modernist architect who decried the fact that in Europe in the early 20th century you could walk down the street and see decades and styles of, I mean, styles and aesthetics from different decades, you know, like he wanted people living in the 1920s, making things that looked like the 1920s, and there was still this, like, Victorian kind of flowery, decorative 
um, style that was still around. Um, so Josiah, in a perverse way, decided to like enact that um, simultaneity of different time, moments in time. And so what he did is dress these characters in um, fashion from different decades. So it's hard to see, but she's wearing like a 60s skirt dress and she's wearing a 20s dress and actually the men's suits also were from the 40s and 50s. So each person had a different decade. Um, and we staged a performance and for those of you who were longtime MANA people, if you remember Molly, um, uh, who used to be SY, um, she was my programs manager at the time, and so she helped um, stage this performance on the opening with all these like dressed um, actors. And uh, so we kind of made the arts club into a club for ongoing presentation of self through uh, aesthetics of different decades. And then we invited members and the public to fashion themselves in different styles and come hang out in there and then have a free lunch. <laughs> so we kind of kept that going. We turned it into a club of clubs. And if anyone ever has any questions, please don't uh, feel free to interrupt. So this was a very obvious kind of engagement with the history and function of the club and the kind of meaning of that modernist aesthetic. But, um, and then the next um, exhibition I'm gonna show was similarly very deeply engaged with our specific history. Um, the British artist named Simon Starling and he did a show called Pictures for an Exhibition. Um, what you're seeing is the back of a camera, um, of an eight by 10 camera. It's the same camera that was used to make the image on the left in 1927, um, so it's not, not the same physical camera, but the same kind of camera that uh, Simon found on eBay. The image on the left is an installation view of our exhibition that, of Brancusi that was curated by Marcel Duchamp. There's a long story behind this exhibition, which I probably won't go into, um, but what Simon did was he went and found all the sculpture that were in that show in 1927 in their current location, and then he re-photographed them where they live today. Most of them are in museums. Two or three were in private collections. And then he made these composite images of them. He digit, like, digitally knit them together. So you were kind of reconstructing the image that you see here. So this is a camera that flips the image, right? Um, it's the kind of camera where you see the image in reverse. So he took our installation view. I don't know if you can see, but it's kind of, it's drawn here upside down. And so when Simon would look into the viewfinder, he would see the sculpture in its current place upside down, and he would match it to its location in the installation view. And so then he would re-photograph it. So then you'd have like somebody's living room, but the sculpture was where it was in our picture. Um, and, and, then she, and then he mixed that in with images like this of the process, and then these great other images that tell about the provenance of every sculpture. So who bought it, who owned it, like the guy who owned the, um, the Cowboys um, football team. So there was an image of a football and another collector who also collected Ferraris. So there was an image of a Ferrari. <laughs> so it was basically prompted by the idea of provenance, sale and resale of works of art, but also um, value. And that has a very specific uh, a kind of jumping off point from the Arts Club. So from that exhibition in 1927, which by, by the way was in the Rigby building, um, we bought this sculpture, Golden Bird, from 1919 for a couple hundred dollars. Um, and <laughs> we kept it until the 1980s. Um, and then we were losing our building um, at Ontario and Rush. And the decision was made to sell the Brancusi um, to finance our future. So I told you sort of at World War II, the Arts Club was kind of ailing and it kind of rebuilt itself by building this Mies space. And then when we were losing the Mies space, again, there was this question, could the Arts Club make it into the future? Um, and there was a self-assessment and basically in order to buy the current building that we live in and the land and to hold a competition to design it, you know, the best way to do that was to sell the Brancusi. The Brancusi had basically the value of everything else in the collection. So we had, you know, if our, if our, exhibition, if our collection was worth 2x, the 
Rancuzzi was worth one X and everything else was the other half. Um, and so it was gonna be auctioned off and then the city sort of responded and instead of us auctioning it off sort of to anybody, uh, we sold it at a discounted price to the Art Institute. Um, and we bought our land. So for Simon, that was a kind of transmutation of art into value, um, into real estate, but also into cultural history, into our future, um, which is a practice that is frowned upon by museum um, uh, rules basically like if you sell a work of art you're supposed to be use it for accessioning um, you know to buy new things rather than into your um, capital budget and into buying land um, but in our particular case we're not an accredited museum and we really would have folded I think in the 80s if that hadn't happened um, but of course you know it's bittersweet um, luckily we get to visit Golden Bird if you haven't seen it it's always out on view at the Art Institute. And we keep a little broken model of it in the office. <laughs> I've been trying to fix it since I got there, like the bird sort of falls off, but gotta, gotta get that fixed. But this is a picture of it in the Russian Ontario building, so it used to just sort of be there in front of a curtain. Um, so that was a fascinating story for Simon, and he made an exhibition out of that history kind of really directly. But other, other artists kind of intersect with the history in a different way, and I wa I'm showing this one because I wanted to talk about the way the Arts Club is in a pr particular position in the city. I just want to check the time and make sure. Okay. Um, this is a show with Jean-Luc Milan, who you may not know, he's a older French photographer. He is known for kind of being a bird whisperer. He sets up these scenarios and he watches nature for like a year, and then he learns the patterns of animals birds in particular, and then he photographs them when they kind of alight on the space that he has sort of uh, camped out and watched for a long time. And we collaborated with the Art Institute. This was a show called Mutual Regard, and there were mutual exhibitions at the Art Institute and the Arts Club, but also at Lurie Garden. So this is actually a pavilion that we built with his photographs in the ceiling um, in a little, like, kind of self-standing pavilion within Lurie Garden. So it was a fun moment for the Arts Club to kind of um, spread itself out and, and be in relation to other institutions. And we really are lucky because, because of our founding idea to be between artists and collectors and the fact that we are not like a collecting institution in the same way. We do have a collection, but we're not like a museum in that way of trying to archive a history of art. We end up being able to be friends with all the institutions in the city. Um, so that's a really nice role to play. So come forward quite a few years. Um, this is the show that we put up the week after the pandemic started. <laughs> we decided even though we were closed, we would walk in and put on our masks and just hang a show and see what happened. So then we ended up extending it for quite a few months. Um, so we did end up having that first summer, if you remember, things were somewhat open and then closed again in the fall. So this is a wonderful show and something I want to, a, a different way of kind of intervening in our history, you know. So whereas Simon and Josiah kind of went straight into the history of the Arts Club and kind of like materialized it in a certain way, Jenny Jones was not interested in us as much as I was interested in her. Um, but what she does in her work um, is uh, a quite sophisticated way of kind of interrupting the modernist legacy. Um, her this exhibition is called Constant Structure, which is a kind of jazz chord progression. And Jenny's work, it you know, looks very minimalist and kind of straightforward. Um, planes of color and very uh, tactile materials. Um, but it's also based on sound. So you have things like crescendo, and this work here is based on the idea of the crescendo and the rest in music notation. And you can actually kind of see it here. She paints the kind of edges of her canvases in this bright red, and it reflects between the shows. So you have this kind of vibrating um, color in unexpected places. And she talks about the history of African-American music being very important to her kind of um, sense of abstraction. So for me, I thought that Jenny's work was a very important um, uh, addition to this kind of very hegemonic white um, masculinist modernism that the Arts Club in some ways resists and in many ways 
participates in. Um, and so it was important to show her work um, in that context and kind of trouble our own trajectory, I guess. But also it's just beautiful and amazing work. So um, that was important for, for me and for Jenny in the conversations that we had about this show um, and how she was gonna put it together. It's tragic that she didn't ever get to come see it. Um, so, but we, we had a, uh, we commissioned um, an essay from um, uh, Ted Moten and he um, read it and, and we had it on recorded and so that was really great. And then Fred Moten and Jenny made a performance at it at the Guggenheim when she had her big show in the fall, last fall. Um, so that had an afterlife. Um, another show like towards the kind of end, middle of the um, pandemic was with Herman Anderson who's a uh, He's of Caribbean descent, but he's a uh, British artist. He was actually born in the UK, but his, all the rest of his family was born in Jamaica. Um, and these are just beautiful paintings. Um, in the other room of the exhibition, there were uh, barbershop paintings, which he's sort of more well, known, more well known for. But these were the paintings of the kind of trip that he took to Jamaica that were brand new. Um, for our exhibition. So it's an approach to landscape. So I guess I wanted to show this just to also say, you know, I just also just show work that I think needs to be seen. Whereas he's incredibly well known um, in the UK and sought after. He really hasn't had not had a show in the US. Um, so that was his first solo show in the US. <laughs> so if you don't know his work, you should look, at, look for it. And then, these now, I'm sh I kind of skipped a lot, but I'm sort of showing you the more recent shows, uh, just to show what I've been doing in the last few years since the pandemic. Hannah Levy, who just had a show open at Casey Cabot in New York last weekend, um, kind of brings in my own interest right in surrealist um, kind of bodily response to um, imaginative um, forms. And she also intersects that kind of creepy uh, animalistic, fleshy type of sculpture with um, a concern for the history of modernist design. So once again, that's a kind of echo of something that intersects really strongly with the history of the Arts Club. Um, she's interested in certain architects that um, also, you know, um, we are, but then she kind of makes it fleshy and contemporary and very, very vital. Kamruz Aram similarly interrupted that trajectory of kind of what is that history by uh, questioning Orientalism and decoration and what the, the decorative is in abstraction. So he's an Iranian born artist and he made this screen, you know, which is, has this kind of uh, botanical abstraction that is very much indebted to the decorative arts like carpets and tile in Persian art but he um, brings that into dialogue with the kind of monochrome um, abstract canvas of the you know, American, European trajectory of abstraction. And then just before our current show was Suzanne Jackson, who is another abstract painter. I guess I was into some kind of like re-questioning of abstraction in the last couple of years. So, um, you know, either th hers is very tactile. She made these self-hanging uh, paintings that are basically pigment. What you're seeing through on the right is, is the pigment of a canvas um, released from the canvas. So she's making paintings that are just the uh, material of the paint and they're self-hanging in the studio. And she's in her uh, late 70s, so she's been painting her whole life and just uh, starting to get quite a bit of recognition lately. I think there will be a retrospective of her work. There was one painting in the Art Institute collection, um, which is a kind of really mucky abject sort of abstraction in which there's like the one on the left has bits of granite, so kind of stone mixed in with this um, medium and the color and bits of detritus from her studio, um, very physical and tactile um, form of painting. And the one that this man is looking at um, was the place that she said she started figuring out that um, method. And it's, it had only been shown kind of once in like a local gallery in Savannah, Georgia, where she taught. Um, it has those big, what she called chocolate slabs, those big rectangles of brown paint um, that were on screen in this painting. And that's where she started to think about what if she just suspended the, the paint 
without the screen or the canvas or the frame. Very importantly, her more recent work does not have a frame. Okay, and currently on view is Jessie Reeves' All Possessive Lust Dispelled, um, which you should come see. It's a sculpture exhibition that kind of deals again with modernist furniture and completely updating it in a very um, vital way. So I just realized that I brought a whole bunch of catalogs to share with all of you. They're in my car. I'll come on and get them. I forgot them in the car, but I have a lot of like past catalogs if anybody wants to look through them or take some. So if I have a minute, I'll go get those. Okay, and I just want to tell you a little bit else. Of, okay, here's my sneak preview that's not even on our website, but summer 2024, we're doing a show with Hagen Yang, and um, it's called Flatworks. And it's going to be like a mini retrospective of all her two-dimensional work. She says she does not make drawings, so it's not a drawing show. But they're all different ways, like vinyl and cutouts and different um, shadow things of making um, two-dimensional work. So stay tuned. That's, a, that's your secret, secret knowledge for the future. Um, and then another thing that I initiated, uh, I think in 2013, were the garden park garden projects and this is where we largely show Chicago based artists so for all of you who are interested um, the the gallery really doesn't show Chicago artists because it is was founded I didn't say this in the beginning but one of its original missions was to bring to Chicago art that wouldn't normally be seen here so by kind of definition we don't really show Chicago based artists so then I got here and I was like we don't work with Chicago artists and we have an amazing artist in Chicago. So this um, space was founded to, we used to have a few tables out there, now we still have a few tables, but we moved them over. Um, and uh, there's this fence on the side, and so it's kind of works that are um, designed to address the street and the interior in this sort of liminal space between the building um, and the sidewalk. One of the first ones but was by Marshall Brown, and it was uh, later acquired by Crystal Bridges um, in Arkansas. And the current one is Andrea Carlson's The Waves Make Break Here Still, which is a mural. It's the first time we ever did a mural on the building. It's a sticker. We didn't actually paint on the building. Um, and this has to do with the status of the land that the Arts Club is standing on, because it was originally part of Lake Michigan, um, and it was covered over in an infill after the fire, and then that whole neighborhood of Streeterville was built on top of that debris. Um, and there was a lawsuit between the indigenous community and the city at a moment, um, claiming that that land had never been ceded because it was part of Lake Michigan, which wasn't owned. Um, the indigenous, uh, they lost that suit, and so the city um, remains you know, claimed the ownership of the land. Um, and her idea of the ways may break her still is that somehow eventually it might be reclaimed either by the lake or by the indigenous people. Um, and then, preview, Yasmin has one of your own, Mana artists, um, has an opening coming up and we're gonna do, she's doing a project in the garden and there's going to be a lime on May 20th from 12 to two, do you wanna say anything? about it now. Okay, but you should all come. This is an outright plug. Um, it's going to be an open public party in the garden, um, and there will be some performance, um, and there will be some thing to drink, and there might be some food, and that will be really fun. The drawing room is another place that we show Chicago-based artists. Um, this is a private space for the membership, and there's a wall and two screens, um, and so we have the ongoing changing of artists on the wall. Max showed um, in the drawing room a couple months ago and he had both the video screens and the wall and I think it was for him, I may be speaking for you, but a way to test out the exhibition that then opened at the Renaissance Society just a couple months later. So that was a long time coming, that collaboration. So we were really happy that he finally showed there. Um, and then, we also commission, I've been focusing on visual art, but we also commission performance um, uh, and we mostly make that, those performances open to the public. So uh, this was something that we commissioned long before the pandemic and then it was postponed and postponed and finally in October 2021, Flutronics performed Black Being, which was a hugely moving um, flute 
performance. They're a flute duo with some electronic and that then received a kind of full orchestral version in Cincinnati a couple months later. And then finally, we have an ongoing architect series. So those are some details. I hope you'll come to those. Those are also public talks. The next one's on March 30th. So if you sign up for our website, we do have many public events, even though we are a member institution. At least monthly, there's a public talk or performance or exhibition or opening. Um, next opening is June 13th, I think, with Brenda Draney, who's a First Nations painter from near Edmonton. Um, and her work deals with uh, kind of trauma and absence of the, the indigenous community where she's from. Okay, that was kind of a run through. Um, any questions? I would love to take them, otherwise I'll run and get my catalogs and go share them with you all. Yeah, Max. This is like a little trivial, but uh, do you know Jenny C. Jones like considers the acoustics like the acoustic potential for work? She must, right? Yeah. I mean, conceptually for sure. So she makes them out of acoustic panels. Um, I, um, so the, that textured material that she uses in the um, paintings is a, a material she orders from a sound company. Um, and so I would say, like, I don't think she cares whether it actually absorbs sound, but she very much cares about the conceptual notion that it could absorb sound. So she has done exhibitions where there is literal sound recordings. Like she did this installation at the Glass House in, uh, in um, Connecticut, and there was a whole sound audio thing. I think she, um, and we talked about whether there would be a sound component for her exhibition here, but instead it was the sort of revert, and this was before we knew it would be up during the pandemic, but I think in the end she was interested in the reverberation of silence um, and not an actual sound. Um, but so yes. I remember it feeling like a little more like muted or something. I think it did. You know, you put all that kind of material up on the walls, and it really does change the way things reverberate. And our that room is very clattery, actually. So it, it could have very well made a significant difference. Yeah.